first of all, I'm just going to give a couple of uh, preliminaries. Um, one is that you'll notice on your screen, well, hopefully you'll notice on your screen on the upper left-hand corner that it says that we are recording. So I've recorded the first um, classes that we did in person. I went back and I, I redid those lessons in order to make them available to people um, in case they wanted to jump into the class and they had missed a class or two or, or, or all of them <laughs> and they wanted to join in um, here. Uh, that way they wouldn't be lost so they wouldn't have lost that material. Um, so we are recording uh, this session so that we can continue adding to that archive, if you will, to that file so people can can go back and if they're not able to join us uh, live for a particular week, they can always go back and catch that. So just know that that's being recorded. So if um, if you don't want your your likeness to appear on the recording, you can turn your video off. Um, or another option too is if if you're not saying anything and your 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 picture doesn't pop up and then. Um, you won't be on that video either. We are going to have uh, some breakaway uh, breakout rooms is what Zoom calls them. Um, we'll split up into smaller groups in order to do some of the discussions similar to the table time that we would do um, if we were actually meeting in person, uh, which we're really grateful that Zoom allows us that feature to be able to do that. Um, and during those breakout sessions or those, um, those smaller groups, uh, those will not be recorded, so you don't have to worry about that. And um, that would be great for you to, if you have the capability to do video so that people can see your faces and so forth as you interact. Um, so it's kind of my introductory uh, spiel. Um, hope to do, uh, you know, do some of the, uh, the teaching up front and then give some um, more of the time on the back end in order to allow you to, to discuss some of those things in those smaller groups and then bring us back uh, together. And uh, we, we kind of tested out some of those features earlier this week, uh, but this will be the first time actually using them um, with a live audience. So forgive us for, for any hiccups. We'll, we're learning as we go. And hopefully that, that turns out um, just fine. So let me pray for us and then we'll, we'll dive in to what we got this morning. Father, we come before you and just uh, humble ourselves and, and recognize that we are uh, completely dependent and completely reliant on on you, who you are, and um, and your will for us. And so, Father, we humbly submit um, to your godship, to your um, leadership over us, Father. And we ask that you would have your way with us. And Father, may we uh, just continue to be in awe um, each and every day of your greatness and and your goodness uh, towards us. And Father, I pray that as we dig into your to your word, as we dig into this study um, together even more, that you would continue to, to grow us and give us the, the tools that we need in order to be able to, um, not just to understand more of your word, but to, as a result of understanding more of it, be able to see you in a, in a, um, in a clearer picture and be able to draw closer to you. And may you continue to grow us in our relationship with you in that way. And we just ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So <clears throat> we've been in this series um, called How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth. And we're essentially going through this book right here, How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth, written by uh, Gordon Fee and Douglas Stewart, who are, um, you would call experts in their fields of um, the New Testament and Old uh, Testament, uh, respectively. Um, I have a pair of books that's Old Testament exegesis and New Testament exegesis that are written by them, uh, ex, you know, exclusively for pastors and scholars of, uh, of the word. And what they've done is they've simplified a lot of what they include in those books um, for the layperson to be able to um, pick up the word and to be able to um, wrestle with um, God's word and, and, um, and get the most out of they're reading. And so that's what we want to do. We want to be able to get the most out of what we're, we're reading in God's word by um, capturing a few principles. Um, and those principles can change from genre to genre in the, uh, in the Bible. And so what we're going to do is we're going to go through each one of those genres that are represented in the Bible and kind of glean some of those principles that we would uh, need in order to be able to get the most out of it. And so um, if you didn't catch the videos, I did two videos on um, an introductory video, and then there's one on the uh, process for the epistles. So the epistles have been 
have been done and they're available on 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 the video on our YouTube channel so you can you can grab those and so today we're going to be looking at Old Testament narrative now with all of these genres one of the things one of the underlying principles is that before we can take God's word and understand it as God's word for us before we can apply it to our lives we have to understand first that it was written to a particular audience um, it was first God's word to them and so in order to uh, be able to apply God's word to us here and now we have to learn what it meant to that original audience then and there and we're not going to be able to do that a hundred percent accurately um, as to what it meant because we're so far removed right culturally um, through language we're not even reading it in the original language it was written in um, the the cult, there's there's so many things that have that have changed we have a, a wide gap to cover and so our our job is to try to recapture as much of that as we can by doing careful reading of god's word um, in order to be able to get as much as we can out of it um, and so today as we look at the uh, old testament narrative um this is the 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 most common type of literature that we find in our bible it makes up 40% of the Old Testament, which is 75% of our Bible. So it represents a huge chunk of um, the literature uh, that we have in the Bible. Um, you got Genesis, Joshua, uh, Judges, Ruth, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, uh, many of those Old Testament books. And then you have, uh, which are exclusively Old Testament narrative, but then we also have some of the Old Testament books that contain partial um, or parts of it that are considered no Old Testament narrative, um, such as Exodus. Uh, you have Numbers, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. So you have some books that contain parts that are uh, Old Testament narrative as well. Now, the New Testament also has narrative, um, but we're going to be looking specifically at Hebrew narrative. Um, Tim's going to catch us up next week on some of that New Testament narrative when he talks about the, uh, the book of Acts uh, next week. So make sure you tune in next week for that. So as, as we begin here i want to talk about a couple of common errors in interpreting because what we're really seeking to do is to interpret god's word um, for us and we all do this on on some level or another and some of the common errors that we would make in reading old testament narrative and seeking to apply it to our lives is uh, allegorizing one of them is allegorizing and that what i mean by that is instead of Concentrating on the clear meaning of the text, we, we tend to look for a hidden meaning beyond the text, as if it's um, reflecting some other, some other meaning um, or intent behind what's clearly there. Uh, another error that we, we can make is uh, decontextualizing. In other words, reading it separated from the historical and the literary context in which it appears um, in the Bible. So if we ignore those contexts, I mean, it's dangerous because we can make any part of God's word mean whatever we want it to really when we divorce it from its context that it appears in. Um, another uh, aspect that we can, or another one mistake that we can make is uh, uh, moralizing. And by moralizing, I mean, um, you know, you read a story within the Old Testament and we think, okay, what was the moral of the story? Um, and and the, the error in that approach is that that, that's not why the Hebrew narratives were written. And so we want to look at that. Why, what, what was the purpose of the Hebrew narratives? Um, you know, in understanding what their purpose was, um, and it wasn't to, um, to give us morals in, in little tidbits and in, in stories and so forth. So that's just a couple of the errors. I could talk more about those. Um, the authors go into much more um, detail on those. But just to give you an idea that, that, that there are common errors that are made in interpreting the Old Testament, and we want to try to avoid as much of that as possible. And so the goal today is to get a better idea of how a Hebrew narrative actually works. All right. Um, what was its purpose and, and how is it structured, laid out and so forth, because that'll help us in our interpreting um, the Old Testament narratives for, for us. So let's talk about the nature of the Old Testament narratives here for a second. They are stories, right? The, it's a purposeful retelling of historical events that happened in the past. Um, and it's, they're intended to give meaning and direction for a given people in the present. And, and perhaps one of the more important principles that we can adopt at this point is to remember that it is ultimately God's story that's being told. It's ultimately about God and God's redemptive work, right? We, we kind of looked at that when we, uh, in the previous class that we did, when we looked at 
the story, the biblical theology and the story, how it all lines up, the, all of biblical narrative um, has an underlying story to it. So there's three parts to a narrative, three basic parts to a narrative, right? You have characters, you have plot, and you have plot resolution. Those three elements you'll see in the Old Testament narrative. Um, the one thing to keep in mind is that there's two levels to this narrative, and I kind of alluded to this already. Um, well, there, there's probably more than two levels, but we're interested in two levels um, for the purposes of this class, right? You have this top level, which is the meta narrative or the overarching story, which I just referred to. There's this, the story of God's redemptive work throughout all of Scripture, and this is one of the reasons why we did that class first. Um, and so if you remember, there's themes and underlying throughout connecting all of Scripture together. But then there's also uh, this first level, um, which is the the hundreds of narratives that are told, uh, the individual stories of Abraham, the story of Isaac, and the story of Jacob, and so that's the other level that we're that we are actually reading in that one section. And so one of the things that we can do, one of the important things that we need to learn to do, is how those individual stories fit into that larger story. Uh, and, and again, that's one of the reasons why we did that class first, so the biblical theology of tracing what that overarching story is throughout Scripture. So going back to that larger story um, and mentioning those three things, you got characters, plot, and plot resolution. So the characters, the main characters in the story, right? God, Satan, and God's people in, in that broad uh, meta narrative. In the basic plot, you have creator God, created us, created people in his image, and then the enemy entered into that picture, persuaded the people to bear his image instead of God's image. And then you get into the plot resolution, which is this long story of redemption, of God rescuing his people from the enemy, restoring us to his image, and eventually restoring all things to him. So that's the, the meta-narrative that's covering all of, of Scripture. But then you have, again, all of these stories that are intertwined, making up that bigger narrative. And so being aware of that hierarchy of the narratives and those two levels of narrative will help us a great deal in understanding Old Testament narrative. So let's talk about some of the characteristics of Hebrew narratives, right? You have a narrator, um, and two important things to note about the narrator is that the narrator's essentially omniscient, right? He chooses what to say in the story, but he's essentially omniscient to what's going on. He never shares all that he knows, nor does he typically comment or explain the narrative itself. His role is to tell the story in a way that you're drawn into that narrative um, so that you can see things for yourself. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that as we get into character development and so forth. Um, the second thing to note about the narrator is that he is responsible for the point of view of the story. The perspective from which a story is told is his, is what, what the author is doing. Um, and in the end, it's ultimately a divine point of view. Of what's God doing through this? Again, as we go, as we, excuse me, reiterate the fact that it's ultimately God's story. Um, but for example, using Joseph's story, and we'll use Joseph's story as kind of our platform this morning. Um, you see all throughout the narrative that the Lord was with Joseph. You see that um, starting um, in Genesis 37 all the way um, through the end of his narrative. Um, and in the end, Joseph, as he is elaborating on uh, and kind of recapping his story, he points us back to that as he says, the Lord was with me. Um, so uh, if you're constantly on the lookout for the point of view that the author, uh, that, that the Hebrew author is trying to give us in that, um, in that narrative, and one of the ways he does this is through the characters themselves. So the characters is another aspect that we want to look at. Um, you know, not surprisingly, the characters are kind of the central element of Hebrew narrative. Um, but not, not with the intent of creating a visual, right? We kind of in our culture, uh, when, when we think of character development, we think of this visual of who the character is, a visual representation in Hebrew authors were not as interested in giving us a visual representation of the characters. They're, they're more interested in um, matters of status, um, their profession, um, tribal designation even, and, and their character themselves, their, what makes up who they are as opposed to their physical appearance. Um, two things stand out when talking about uh, Old Testament narrative characters. 
One is that characters will often appear in contrast or in parallel to each other. Um, most often they're contrasted and, and they kind of have to be understood in the context of that comparison or, or, or contrast. For example, Joseph, as we're looking at his story, Joseph and his brothers are contrasted quite a bit all throughout the narrative. Um, Joseph's character versus his brother's character and how that plays out in the narrative. Um, you have it again with Joseph and Potiphar's wife, the contrast there. Um, you have it again with Joseph and the, uh, and the advisors to Pharaoh. You have that contrast again. And so understanding the contrast that the author is drawing on in that narrative helps us also to understand what's going on. Um, and then the other aspect of characters that, that, that I want to touch on is the fact that the author um, very rarely will tell us the development of the character. He, he will rarely develop the character by way of narration. Most often he will tell us um, what the character is doing or saying and let us draw our conclusions about that character's um, moral um, standing or, or, or what have you or how they're developing um, through their actions and through their, their words. They won't just come out and say, I, I think of, I think of um, Luke and how he tells us that Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and with man. Um, Old Testament narratives are not going to do that for us. They're going to tell us what he said and what he did and let us draw our own conclusions from that. So you have to, you have to be cognizant of how that's developing. One of the ways that they do that, again, is, is through the dialogue. Um, dialogue plays a really significant role in Old Testament narrative. It often points us to that point of view that we, are talk that we were talking about earlier, where the author is trying to give us a certain point of view from which to view that narrative. And a lot of times that's done through the dialogue that's going on in the story. Um, they'll also accentuate certain crucial parts of the story through that dialogue. Um, for example, Joseph at the end of his story in chapter 50 of Genesis um, kind of recaps the crucial parts of his story through that dialogue. It, it's more of a monologue, but um, it, it, it's presented as that dialogue. And so the dialogue is really key. And so whenever you see an Old Testament narrative going to a dialogue, you want to hone in on that and what, what kind of point of view is being accentuated and what crucial parts of the story stand out through that dialogue. Um, and, and so let me make one more note here on the plot of Hebrew narratives. Plot in Hebrew narrative is going to move quickly, much quicker than what we're used to in our storylines, um, even faster than what our short stories would, um, would look like. Because of that, when you notice the plot slow down, that's a, that's a huge indicator that we need to be paying attention to what's going on. And Hebrew narrative, the author will often use dialogue to slow the plot down. Um, so again, that's another indication that dialogue is extremely important. Um, in that. Not only through dialogue, but he'll also slow the plot down with a, an elaboration of detail in a particular um, a point, um, honing us into detail that we need to be cognizant of, so slowing down the plot that way, and also through the use of repetition. If you see things that are rep rep repeated um, over and over again within the course of the narrative, like that's another uh, point that we need to be aware of and that we need to hone in on and pay special attention to. And that goes into this, the structure of a Hebrew narrative, um, the last point that I'm going to make here. When looking at the structure of a Hebrew narrative, we have to understand that um, Hebrew narrative was intended for hearers more than readers. And because of that, uh, it, it tends to have a different structure than what we're used to. Um, it contains different features that we may not be as used to when we're talking about reading a book. So because a Hebrew author is, is playing into um, hearers rather than readers, there's going to be a lot more of that repetition that, that, that I was just talking about. Um, you'll see a lot of key words because they're trying to make that story memorable to somebody who's hearing it rather than, than, than reading it. Um, there's patterns that, that kind of follow the storyline and the plot that you wouldn't necessarily otherwise see in, in, in reading. Um, for example, in, um, in Joseph's story, uh, 
you have parts parts that almost seem like they're that you're reading again and you, you kind of go back and you say didn't i already read this but it's that repetition that he includes in there in order to make sure that that part stands out and that you remember it based on that repetitive pattern so what we're going to do now i'm going to push you all into um, some breakout rooms so in smaller groups in order to discuss this aspect of it. And so we're, we're looking at these features, repet repetition, keywords. And so what we're going to do is we're going to read Genesis 37, verses 1 through 11. Genesis 37, verses 1 through 11. And what I want you to do is two questions here uh, as you read this section. What are some of the key words and phrases that you see used in this passage? And how do they help you understand or take note of what's going on in this narrative? So again, we'll say it one more time. Genesis 37, verses 1 through 11. And I want you to ask two questions as you're reading that. One is, what are some of the key words and phrases that you see? What are some of um, perhaps the, the, the themes, the what is emotions or that's going on that's being repeated? And how do they help you understand what's going on? How do they help you understand or take note of the narrative that's being told? Um, okay, so that's part one. Okay, part two is just two more two more verses that are or two more passages that are uh, that go on from Joseph's narrative, and that is Genesis forty two six through nine, and then Genesis fifty verse eighteen. Let's say those again. Genesis 42, 6 through 9, and then Genesis 50, verse 18. And that is, um, I'll tell you right now, that's part of the repetition that I want you to notice that he, that he uses over and over again. But I want you to actually see it in this narrative. And, uh, and so what do you, uh, with those two, what is that repetition that you see? And how does it help you understand what's going on through the narrative? All right, so I'm going to push this button to push you into breakout rooms and hopefully it works and then I'll call you guys back in a <clears throat> All right, so if you will open up your chat window off on the right side of your screen, use that um, chat window there. What are some of the things, what are some of those keywords and phrases that you found in, um, in Genesis 37, one through 11? So make sure that you got that message going to everyone so everybody can see that. And, uh, and we'll call out, what are some of those keywords and phrases? Bowing, okay. Love of the father versus hatred of the brothers. Jealousy, yeah, jealousy for sure is one of those. You see the word jealousy or hatred pop up several times there in that passage. Brothers, yep. Brothers is a huge one. The relationship between those two is one of those things that's... Um, that's drawn out in that section. Uh, if you were to continue reading the rest of Genesis 37, you see the word brother a total of 20 times. Um, so the author is definitely trying to draw that out, that relationship between them. Ruling over, hated, yep. Hated and jealousy, both being used quite a bit. So you see these, these aspects that are um, being drawn out in there, how do they help us to understand the the narrative? So, what are some just a short short blip here? What, how does it help us understand? Where does it draw our attention to? What does it help us to focus in on? Yep. Give. Okay. Giving perspective on relationships. Yep, giving perspective, especially between Joseph and um, his brothers. With continued reference to that. And that's something that continues to develop throughout the rest of the narrative, right? As we know the story of Joseph. And we see that relationship playing a really strong part of that narrative all the way through. Current of the dreams. Yeah, the, the dreams are fulfillment. And so in reading Genesis 42 and Genesis 50, what's that repetition there that we see pop, pop up between those, uh, in those other two places? The bowing, yes. So we see right at the beginning in Genesis 37, Joseph tells his dream where everyone's bowing to him, right? And he catches a lot of flack for that. But then in Genesis 42, 
we see that his brothers actually come and essentially the this comes true this dream finds its fulfillment and then his brothers come before him not knowing who he is and they bow before him and then again in genesis 50 his brothers come and they bow before him and so that's a repetitive aspect of it um a, a repetitive part of the story um and in fact if you look at so genesis 37 joseph's telling of that dream it kind of propels the plot forward and then in genesis 50 joseph is narrating again um uh but and in that process in that scene we see that the bowing again um, found the fulfillment and so you see the um everything come full circle if you will so again because it's written for an audience of hearers rather than readers having that repetitive element in there helps to to move the story along and be memorable to people who are um who are auditory learners if you will of that story so one of the things that we have to re to re for sure remember in reading um, Old Testament narrative, and we said this already, but just to bring it out again, is that God is the ultimate character in that narrative. Uh, and to miss that is to miss the uh, intent of the, the narrative entirely. That's, the, that's one of the points of view that the Hebrew author is going to be coming from, is that this is God's story. And so along with that, there's this one other element that I want to talk about in the last 15 minutes here. Well, um, I want to talk about real briefly and then... Um, do another breakout group and that is kind of reading between the lines um there's things that are explicit and things that are implicit when we read a story right um and, and i want to be clear here we're not looking for a hidden meaning in a story right i i already explained that one of the common misconceptions or one of the common errors we make in interpreting uh hebrew narrative is the fact that we try to read something beyond the narrative that's not really there, but we're trying to read in, um, read into something that's um, that's hidden, um, and that's not the case. But what we mean by explicit or implicit, um, explicit, he's going to come out and tell you exactly what he wants you to know. Implicit just means that the author is counting on you to know something already that he's alluding to, that's explained somewhere else in scripture or culturally that's there, that we don't necessarily have access to um, in terms of by way of our culture. Um, and so we would do well to to look at other places in Scripture that help inform that, which it, which is that which is implied. And so one of the examples that I want to try to um, to bring out here is in the book of Ruth to to look at this implicit um, aspect of it because what again we're not looking for hidden meaning what we're trying to do is to discover a shared assumption that's that should already be there between the narrator and the audience the narrator already assuming that the audience has this knowledge and has this has this knowledge base already that he's alluding to but he's not coming out and saying it um, and and that's what we're trying to grasp again not a hidden meaning but an assumption that's already there existing from the narrator's uh, narrator's point of view so in Ruth one of the one of the things that, uh, that that people like to say about the story of Ruth is that it's a it's a great love story. Um, sure, on the surface it may seem like a like a love story, but um, the implicit uh, intent from the narrator's point of view is that it's a story of God's kindness, right? And this is um, actually uh, let me back up. Not just implicit, but he explicitly says so um, in uh, verses uh, chapter one, verse eight, where he talks about God's kindness. Um, 2.20 and in 3.10, you'll see the reference to God's kindness. And is it, again, this repetitive uh, repetitive pattern here of talking about God's kindness. And we see God's kindness playing out through the characters in the story as well. But I want to um, go into um, Ruth to, to look at this aspect of implied, um, this implied or a shared assumption, is that in Ruth 1... If we would all turn there, Ruth chapter 1, verses 15 through 18, right? We know the story of Ruth. You know, so Ruth marries the, uh, the, the husband of Naomi, and her husband passes. Um, and then she moves back, or at least they go back to Israel. And as they are going back, Ruth... Oh, I'm sorry, Naomi tells Ruth that she can go go back, back to her people. And then we have this statement 
that is, that is made here um, in 15.18. I'll just read this out loud. In verse 15 it says, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people. This is Naomi tell, talking to Ruth. And to her gods, return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or to return them following, from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said, no more. One of the implied things, or the biggest implied thing that, that, that is going on here, is that we see Ruth is converting to Judaism. He's, she's converting, she's accepting Yahweh as her God, Right, because she comes from this other culture and this other uh, country where Yahweh is not their God. Right, in verse 15, Naomi is referencing Orpah going back to her gods um, and to, to and to her people. And so, in when we see here in in verse 16, where Ruth is telling her, "Your God will be my God," she is saying that she is renouncing her gods and following Yahweh as her God. And it's it's a very subtle, um, it, you know, he's, the narrator's not drawing it out and not saying explicitly this is what Ruth did. He's assuming that by reading that, you understand that that's what's going on. Um, and that's, a, that's kind of important in the development of the story. And so what I want you to do here in groups, I'm gonna do, we're going to do another breakout session for the last 10 minutes that we've got. And I want you to read Ruth chapter 2, verses 1 through 16. Ruth chapter 2, verses 1 through 16. And what I want you to look, what, what's implied in that section? So I want you to um, try to sh try to discover that shared assumption that the narrator has, that by reading this, that you would understand what, what is going on, um, what, what information is implied that he's not explicitly saying in Ruth chapter 2, verses 1 through 16. So you may end up in different groups this time. I don't know. I'm not quite sure how they assign breakout rooms, but I'm going to push you into back into um, some of these breakout rooms. Um, oh, it looks like you'll end up in the same room. Okay. All right. So we'll see you in about 10 minutes. Welcome back again. All right. So similar as last time, open up the chat window over to your right. So from those 16 verses that we read in, in, in Ruth, um, what are some of the things that the author was implicitly saying, but not outright or explicitly saying, that he was counting on you to grasp on that's important to the storyline? What did we notice? Okay, gleaning was not stealing. For sure. And if you knew that if you, from the uh, uh, the law, we see that gleaning was was built into the law. And that was part of um, what um, a provision that God had made in the law that he gave to the Israelites to provide for for other people, such as um, those um, in Ruth's position. Boaz was more generous than was expected of him. Okay, absolutely. So you get that you 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 get that one glimpse, or you get you get that aspect of Boaz's character. Um, she was moved from lowly status to esteemed position. She was, um, yes, as a foreigner, Ruth had lower status in Israel society for sure. Yep, different stat social status for sure. Boaz is quite keen for Ruth, indeed, indeed, and he. You get a big picture. Uh, you get a big picture of Boaz, right? Going back to Lydia's comment of Boaz was more generous than was expected of him. That that paints him in a certain light. And and again, going back to what we said about the book being about God's kindness, we see that reflected in Boaz, um, in Boaz being kind in his dealing with Ruth. Right? He didn't need to do all that. He yes, he met the requirements of the law, but he went above and beyond that even um, as he uh, interacted with Ruth. Goodwill between Boaz and the people, absolutely. Both had noble character, great, all, all great things, yes. So these are things that the author is not explicitly saying, but he's showing you through the character development as well as there are some things like 
um, what Tim mentioned about the, the knowledge of the law, that all Israelites would have known what the law says about gleaning, um, but we may not necessarily because that, that's not a part of our culture. And so it's something that you, we, we would go back into, into the law to see, okay, so what is this gleaning that he's talking about? And we would see the God's law um, as he prescribed in, in, in what circumstances and what gleaning was all about. And we'd see that play a picture. Um, Leviticus 19, thanks, Chad. There you go. In Leviticus 19, you can look at that and, and see where gleaning is mentioned in the law and how Boaz was going above and beyond what that law required of him. And so we see that uh, this is just an example of that implicit knowledge that the author is kind of expecting you to have. Um, he certainly expected that of his readers and that we need to kind of acquire uh, on the side through a little bit of extra digging in order for us to arrive at that same at that same level and to, to catch that implicit um, aspect of it. So that's important. So when you read something like, like the phrase gleaning, and we not necessarily, you know, we can... Um, kind of a, a assume some things, but um, if, when you reach something something like that in Old Testament narrative, that it would behoove us to to do a little bit more digging and find out what that's all about. And biggest thing in this, remember that implicit does not mean secret. It's not something that's hidden. It's not some hidden meaning or some secret issue that's behind the text. It's not the case at all. Um, we're looking for the clear. Uh, meaning of what the author is is saying, not some hidden meaning back there. And so this this stuff that's implicit is a shared assumption that the narrator has of his readers. So hopefully that was that was good, and I hope that helps in continued study as you um, go into Old Testament narratives. I know a lot of times we shy away. Uh, we may try to shy away from Old Testament narratives simply because it's Old Testament and and uh, we relate more with the New Testament writings, but I hope that that in gaining some of this and looking at some of this that we did today, that it helps and encourages you to go back and do some more digging into the Old Testament narratives um, as part of your um, as part of your study of the scriptures. And so, um, I just want to close with just a a couple of other principles for interpreting Old Testament narratives, and then I'll close us off in prayer. But one is to know that an Old Testament narrative usually does not directly teach a doctrine, right? Um, as a, It's not going to directly come out. Again, it's not going to explicitly teach a doctrine. It's going to illustrate some things because through the example and through the uh, storytelling of somebody, there, there are principles that are going to be illustrated in that. But an Old Testament narrative is not going to come out and teach some form of doctrine. Um, that, that wasn't the intent of why the, the Old Testament writers um, were writing or why these Hebrew uh, narratives were written. Um, so what does it do and how can we use that in terms of doctrinal knowledge? Because there are things we glean from Old Testament writings to help form doctrine and to inform it. And that is, again, Old Testament narrative usually illustrates whether it's a, a doctrine that is taught elsewhere in Scripture. Um, and so, again, having a knowledge um, broader than just that which we're, that we're reading in that moment in that Old Testament narrative helps to flesh out um, some of that. Um, so that principle is, is just another thing to keep in mind as we're looking at Old Testament narrative. Um, so I hope this was helpful to you. And um, I'm going to close this in prayer and so that we can kind of reset and get ready for our, our 1030 gathering together. And I hope to see you there. So let's pray. Father, we thank you. Thank you for who you are. We thank you for your word. We thank you that, um, although this was written um, so many years ago, God, and, and even though that we're removed from it in terms of, of culture and, and language and so forth, um, we understand it to be your word, God, and we understand it to be uh, one of the ways that you have revealed yourself to us and your plan for us and your will for us. And so, Father, we understand and we we grasp the importance of it, and we want to be able to do due diligence um, and to explore all that we can, um, so that we we can we can glean those things that you have already um, given to us through your holy word. So, Father, help us, give us wisdom, and give us guidance, lead us with your Holy Spirit as we explore these things, and we know that you will be faithful in that, as we are faithful to understand you as best as we can through your word. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you, and we'll see you soon. Thanks.